Welcome everybody. We are very honored to have some very special guests with us today from the Alzheimer's Association. This is a different type of a, a meeting than we've had before and we have some um, researchers that are with us as well as our, our regular Alzheimer's uh, facilitators. So with that, I am going to have Michelle Quiroga Diaz um, start the program. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Kathy. It's nice to see everyone, see some familiar faces as well. So welcome to today's webinar. I am Michelle Quiroga Diaz. I am with the California Southland chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. And we have two incredible guest speakers today who will share important information as well as their expertise. The Alzheimer's Association is a global leader in research, mobilizing the field to advance the vision of a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. And so today's webinar will discuss the latest in Alzheimer's and dementia research. It is my pleasure to first introduce Susan Howland. Susan is the Director of Programs with the California Southland Chapter, and she will kick off our discussion. Following Susan's uh, presentation, we are very fortunate to have Dr. April Timms uh, as our uh, second guest speaker. Dr. Timms is a clinical neuropsychologist. I invite you both to share more about yourself um, during your presentation. And I do wanna thank you both for your time and for being with us today. I will be moderating the Q&A at the end of our presentation. We'll make time for that. So I really do encourage you to send those questions either directly to me in the chat or if you can please put that in the chat function. Without further delay, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan to get us started. Thank you both. Perfect, thank you very much. I do, we both have uh, PowerPoint slides to share with you. So let me go ahead and share my screen so you can see those. Of course, it never works as smoothly as I want it to, so I apologize. Oops, there we go. And can you see my slides? Yes. Thank you. So um, I'm actually not a researcher. I am a program director with the California Southland chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. And I'm what we call a research champion. And that means I'm somebody who takes some of this fancy research and really translates it into everyday language. So everybody can be familiar and comfortable talking about some of the current research that is occurring. Uh, Michelle gave you a nice overview of um, the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you. Um, you may or may not know this information. I just kind of wanted to do a couple slides, which are a little bit more level setting. So this is the 2021 Alzheimer's facts and figures that we release each March. And it just continues to show the heavy burden of Alzheimer's on individuals and families and society. And that is continuing to grow. So right now there are about 6 million Americans over age 65 living with Alzheimer's today. And that number is expected to be about 12.7 or roughly double by the year 2050. And this is a disease that is a heavy burden, not only on the health system, but also on families. We are the ones that are the primary caregiver for those loved ones. This year, we also produced a special report looking at access to healthcare, and we found some discrepancies. So what, upwards of 33% of Latinos or Hispanics and upwards of 50% of Black or African Americans have reported that they experience discrimination when seeking health care. And this is really significant to us in addressing both Alzheimer's disease care and support, but also the research to find effective treatments and ultimately a cure for the disease. There are some additional kind of health disparities around you know, gender as well. Almost two thirds of Americans living with Alzheimer's right now are women. And not really sure why, but research right now is suggesting that it might be both you know, biological as well as life experiences that play into this disparity. Um, Blacks or African-Americans are twice as likely and Hispanic or Latino Americans are about one and a half times more likely as older whites to have Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. 
This prevalence might be driven by underlying cardiovascular health conditions or other factors related to social determinants of health. Um, and just kind of as an aside, there really has been a lack of diversity in a lot of the research that has occurred for Alzheimer's disease and the related dementia. And one of our real um, kind of priorities is making sure that to understand what drives dementia in all individuals and be able to have those effective therapies or interventions that work for everybody that is impacted. Uh, this might be familiar to you. I call it a nice little level setting slide, but just to kind of differentiate Alzheimer's from dementia, and that's probably the most common question I always receive. So dementia really is just a collection of symptoms that kind of encompass cognitive decline. And that could be caring for oneself, you know, preparing healthy meals, uh, driving to a location, uh, managing finances. Typically, when we think of dementia and Alzheimer's, we normally think of just memory, but it really is larger. It encompasses thinking, judgment, planning, communication, um, orientation to time and space. Also, dementia can have some of these behavioral and psychological symptoms as well. And those might include agitation, anxiety, uh, sleep disturbances, uh, hallucinations, maybe even some delusions. So Alzheimer's is the biological process in the brain that creates or causes those dementia symptoms. And it is the most common reason why older adults will have the dementia. Um, sort of the top four reasons would be Alzheimer's, account for about 60 to 80%. Vascular issues, and that's really anything that interferes with the body's ability to get blood, oxygen, and nutrients to the brain, and that can compromise its functioning. Lewy body dementia, which you know sometimes it's called dementia, Lewy bodies or Parkinson's disease dementia, and then frontal temporal dementia rounds out the type four. Although there are many, many, many different reasons why individuals might experience dementia as well as cognitive decline. This is what we might call a continuum of cognitive impairment. Um, it is also important to note that although each box is equal size, that's not really how it plays out in day-to-day -day life whatsoever. But we are beginning to understand that cognitive decline and cognitive impairment can occur across a continuum that span many years. So, and it is often, it is caused by some sort of abnormal or not a normal cause of aging process in the brain. So individuals may have a mild cognitive impairment, and that is some cognitive decline, but it doesn't interfere with day-to-day -day life. Um, some individuals will progress to dementia or Alzheimer's, and some will not. And it's important to note that anyone who does have dementia typically has passed through that MCI or mild cognitive impairment stage. And that really is an interesting area for research. If we can keep people in a mild cognitive impairment stage and maybe slow or not have them progress with their decline, it could potentially lessen the number of people that develop some type of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So this might be another level setting slide. You might all already know this, but with Alzheimer's disease, there are really three hallmarks. The first is plaques which occur between those nerve cells, those brain cells. There are tangles, tau tangles, which occur within a nerve cell. And there's that neurodegeneration. So hopefully, um, I know a lot of faces are covering that slide for me, but on the left is a healthy brain and on the right is a brain that has um, severe Alzheimer's disease. And you'll notice that it's smaller in size and that a lot of the damage in the brain occurs in areas that are important for cognition, memory, and just general day-to-day -day functioning. 
So why are we at risk? Who might be at greater risk for developing Alzheimer's or some other type of um, dementia? And it really falls into two categories. One might be non-modifiable risk factors, things that we can't change. We can't change our age. We can lie, but we can't technically change our age. Um, genetics, you know, we can't pick and choose what DNA we inherit from our parents. And the other piece that I think is interesting is that whole family history. So it goes a little bit beyond genetics and really includes that shared environmental and lifestyle experiences that we oftentimes have with our siblings and you know that family unit. The good news is that there are factors that we do have some control over. These include cardiovascular disease, education, social and cognitive engagement, diet, exercise, and sleep. And that's really an area I'll talk about in a little bit more um, in a few slides as potential, you know, kind of maintaining or addressing these risk factors as possibly lessening kind of cognitive decline. Uh, but first, you know, there are some therapies available for Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, Dr. Alzheimer's identified this disease in 1906. However, some of the first medications to hit the market weren't until 1996. So the drugs or the therapies that I just highlighted, they are available to treat some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And they're only FDA approved to treat Alzheimer's, although we do know physicians do prescribe for other dementia as well as MCI. So the, this drug class, it doesn't stop or reverse the disease process. It's more of a cognitive enhancer and treats the symptoms of the disease. So we do know that they do not benefit everybody. Um, some, they can be effective somewhere from six to 12 months, sometimes a little longer. But overall, they do not change that underlying biology of the disease process of Alzheimer's disease. So what would be ideal is if we could eventually have medication or therapies that slow or ideally stop that progression. So most recently, many of you may have heard in the news, um, the FDA approved um, in early June of this year, um, aducanumab, which is on the market as aduhelm. And it was granted accelerated approval by the FDA. This is the first treatment that addresses the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease. Aducam aducanumab treats and reduces amyloid plaques in the brain of individuals with Alzheimer's, which is reasonably likely to lead to a reduction in the clinical decline due to Alzheimer's. Uh, the treatment was studied in people living with early Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's who showed evidence of a buildup of those amyloid plaques in the brain. So going back to that picture of the brain, individuals who had that buildup of plaque and also were earlier on in that continuum of cognitive decline. So to me right now, it's a really exciting time in research. And the next couple of slides I have, I hope I will share some glimmers of hope with all of you. Um, but advancement is always happening, and it's not just in one area. You know, research occurs in every front line across disciplines, fields, industries, milestones are being achieved. Um, a little bit about us, you know, the Alzheimer's Association is the largest nonprofit funder of Alzheimer's and all dementia research in the world. Um, in terms of total funding, we're only behind the U.S. government and the Chinese government in terms of funding research. Currently, the Alzheimer's Association has about um, $250 million invested in active grants, which is about 750 projects in 39 countries and on six continents. Um, of interest, the only continent that does not have any research being funded right now is Antarctica. So I always give you the challenge if you have a project for Antarctica, maybe we can have research on all seven continents. Um, if you wanna think about Los Angeles County, 
Right now, there are about 12 active grants, totaling about $16.5 million. And those are occurring in our backyard at Caltech, USC, and UCLA. One area that I personally find interesting is this biomarker technology. And it's really changing the game for this field and the research is moving at a remarkable pace. You know, these are the tools that will change our experience in the physician's office and in many ways in the future. But they're already critical in how we conduct research studies today. So biomarker might not be a term that we feel that we can describe or know what it is, but you already know what this concept is. Whenever we go to the doctor and have a cholesterol test or a blood sugar test, those are biomarkers for heart disease and diabetes. So a biomarker is simply something you can measure in the body that tells you something about the disease process. So the Alzheimer's Association funded one of the initial um, areas, which was Dr. Bill Klunk, who developed the amyloid PET imaging. And that was really the first time you could see amyloid buildup in the brain of somebody who is living, which is really a critical breakthrough and is used a lot now in many of the research studies. Um, but we do recognize that these scans can be expensive and hard to get. So scientists continue to research new kinds of biomarkers that will be a lower cost, non-invasive and reliable markers of disease. What this might look like could be um, spinal fluid, uh, blood, eye tests, and even saliva. So that's what we're looking at in the future. Another reason why biomarkers I think are somewhat exciting is that they're helping to modernize the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. You know, we used to only be able to diagnose somebody when they were well into the disease process, you know, once they were already showing signs of cognitive decline. And that diagnosis was really done on medical history and cognitive testing. But biomarkers are shifting that paradigm. And we now know that clinical symptoms of cognitive impairment may be due to changes that are occurring in our brains and bodies anywhere from 10 to 20 years before symptoms appear. So this, again, offers us an opportunity for potential intervention as well as prevention. You know, we need to be able to identify who is most at risk for developing cognitive impairment and dementia, and we may be using these tools in the future to help diagnose disease and also start treatments and risk reduction strategies earlier. Um, one study that has shown the ability to reduce cognitive decline, kind of movement into mild cognitive impairment and dementia, is the Sprint Mind study. And this tested whether treating blood pressure, really aggressively treating blood pressure, specifically um, this systolic number, that's the top one, keeping it at about 120, would decrease the risk for developing, like I said, cognitive impairment and dementia. And they found that this is the case. And it tells us that there are things that we can do today that help reduce our risk and keep our brain healthy. And kind of that idea of what's good for our heart is good for our brain. What I really liked about the Sprint Mind study is that it allowed individuals to work one-on-one -on -one with their physician about what is the best medication, lifestyle interventions to achieve that 120 systolic blood pressure. I thought that was exciting. Other interventions to possibly reduce the risk are really kind of a, a collection of lifestyle factors. Um, some of the so some of the strongest research to date suggests controlling cardiovascular risk factors, and that might be helpful in delaying cognitive decline. Other healthy factors that may slow down decline include cognitive and social stimulation, and a healthy diet or physical activity, and those both also improve cardiovascular health. So the Alzheimer's Association is embarking on a large scale clinical trial 
to study a multi-domain lifestyle intervention and its impact on reducing risk for cognitive decline. It builds off a successful trial that was conducted in Finland called the FINGER trial and that found that these multiple lifestyle interventions can decrease the risk of cognitive decline in an elderly at-risk Finland Finnish population. So in the United States, we have the U.S. Pointer, and it's looking at two lifestyle interventions that encourage physical exercise, a healthy diet, cognitive and social activities, and health monitoring. There are two, it's a randomized control trial. So there is a self-guided component or individuals are placed in a more structured group with like a, a health navigator almost. It will occur over two years with about 2,000 individuals in five U.S. cities. One of those will be UC Davis, which is just north of us. Um, eligibility in or individuals between 60 to 79 who do not have any type of memory problem at the moment, but have a primary relative, so a mom, a sibling, a dad, with a history of memory problems. And they must have room, and this is the part I love, room for improvement in terms of their lifestyle behavior. So these are people that probably have not had a great diet, active lifestyle, cognitive stimulation. So they're looking at um, improving those lifestyle functions and the eventual impact on the brain. So hopefully the U.S. Pointal study will inform an accessible and sustainable community-based lifestyle program for risk reduction. Why all of this is important is that there is the potential to kind of change the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. Um, all the science we've been discussing today boils down to an effort to change that trajectory. So we believe that if a treatment or even lifestyle interventions can be put in place by the year 2025, that could delay the onset of Alzheimer's by just five years, that is projected that 5.7 million people that would be expected to develop Alzheimer's by 2050 would not. And to me, that's just a significant impact on both individuals, families, and society in general. So one resource I will leave you with is um, the Alzheimer's Association has a Science Hub app. So maybe you can add that to your monthly Zoom um, education class. Um, but this is something you can download for free at your favorite app store. And at your fingertips, you have access to the most recent up-to-date news on Alzheimer's and related dementia research and findings. And the best part, it is written for us. So it's not in any sort of fancy terms, but it's in layman's terms and pretty easy to understand and also very trustworthy. And so with that, I am going to pass this over to Dr. Timms to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was really great. I'm so glad you covered a lot with of what you did because it ties into what I would like to discuss with all of you today. Um, so as soon as my, so hopefully everyone can see my slides. All right, great. Um, Hello everyone, thank you for being here. My name is April Timms. I'm a board member for the Alzheimer's Association Southern California chapter. And I'm also an associate professor and clinical neuropsychologist at UCLA. And I'm going to be coming from both a clinical, my, I'm gonna wear my clinician hat and I'm going to wear my research hat as I go through this talk because I think it's, um, important to sort of give you an idea of why I became interested in Alzheimer's and related dementias in the first place. Um, it all starts with patients. So when I am referred a patient by neurology, psychiatry, or primary care, the question is always about this person has some type of cognitive issue that they're complaining about or their family member is concerned about. And this was a patient who I saw probably about four years ago now. And um, 
I'm only calling him Mr. J. That's just to keep um, him anonymous. Um, he was a 75 year old African American male. He was initially seen by primary care. And then what happened was they sent him over to psychiatry because there were some concerns about anxiety. So it was initially looked at as, oh, this might be you know, something relevant for psychiatry. But then um, the psychiatrist evaluated him and Mr. J you know, pretty much denied that he was experiencing the common symptoms that we know go with anxiety. Um, and then given a screener for dementia, which is a very short test, but he fell in a range of concern. So I met with Mr. J and his daughter. So usually how I start is I always interview the patient and if they have a family member with them, I spend about an hour and a half just talking with them, gathering some history about what's been going on. And then I spend the remaining time administering cognitive tests that we know tap into certain functions like memory, like attention, like language. So after speaking with them, I learned that Mr. J's behaviors didn't just start. Even though that's how they pr were presented, they actually, once I dug into the history, particularly with the daughter, I learned that they, he started to change about 10 years ago after he had a stroke. And looking through his medical history, um, because one of the things that I like to do is I ask patients, please bring me your medical record. I wanna see everything. I wanna see all your visits, your labs, all that. So looking through, I noticed that he had hypertension and diabetes um, and his daughter had told me, well, I noticed my dad's memory was changing, but I thought it was just normal for old age. So, um, you know, that's what she said. And I said, well, you know, sometimes there are memory problems that happen as a part of normal aging. But from what it sounded to me like it was a little bit more than that. So when I did the evaluation, found that he was indeed suffering from vascular dementia. So as um, Susan went over, dementia is an umbrella term and it consists of different types. And whenever we see cognitive decline that follows a vascular condition, whether it's cardiac arrest, whether it's um, stroke, we often um, call this vascular dementia. So I started thinking about Mr. J and is there any way his care could have been improved? And one is that in looking at his medical history, um, I noticed that his medical conditions were really poorly managed. He had uncontrolled hypertension, would go off and on meds, wasn't completely adherent. And it did not seem that his medical team had really been aggressively treating this. And so, you know, one of the factors is that had his conditions been better managed, he probably, it would have prevented him possibly from having a stroke. But let's say even if he was going to have a stroke, after the stroke, his cognitive status really should have been monitored. There should have been a follow through evaluation. There should have been um, consults with neurology. There should have been subsequent MRI scans and none of that happened. And as soon as behavioral changes were noticed, which were 10 years ago after the stroke, that would have been a really good time for me to have seen him because when I evaluated him at the age of 75, if I would have seen him at 65, I would have been able to have a trajectory of his cognitive performance and to be able to say whether or not he's declined or staying the same. And that's extremely as important as for me to be able to evaluate someone at multiple time points. So I, I say this because there's really an importance for early detection. And we have the research that's ongoing right now. And hopefully they will discover biomarkers that can be assessed earlier on before cognitive changes occur. But even right now, I push people in our sort of current healthcare landscape 
to try to get um, an evaluation earlier on. Don't wait until symptoms become really severe. I would rather go to the doctor and say, I think I'm having memory problems. And if they say to me, oh no, you're actually okay. This is, you're, you're just worried. I would rather come out of that situation saying, okay, maybe I worried about something extra that I didn't need to worry about than missing the boat and not being evaluated when I actually should have been. We know that from the research that um, people who actually have dementia and suffer from these conditions, when you ask them about their quality of life, you would think that someone would say memory, if I had my memory, that would really optimize my quality of life. But it actually, the research shows that people report that their living situation, ability to do fun, fun things and socialize, those are components that actually better contribute to quality of life outcomes in dementia than whether or not the memory actually improves. So that is something to be said about the lifestyle factors that was mentioned in the previous presentation. As in um, someone who's been in the medical field for a while, I have seen a number of patients who have stroke, but there are always these, um, I would say 90% of the time from anecdotal evidence, there's about 90% of the cases that have some sort of underlying health condition. Um, that being hypertension, we know people with hypertension are five to 30 times higher risk for stroke. Um, people with diabetes are at 1.5 times higher risk, heart disease, two to three times higher risk and obesity, two times higher. And the reason that these conditions converge and tend to lead to stroke outcomes is because what's common is the vascular system. And so what I mean, um, I'll talk about the vascular system in a second but I just want to link that not everybody that has a stroke is going to go on to develop dementia. So that's really important to keep in mind. Some I've seen patients who have had a stroke and they are fine, they recover um, some of the functions that are initially lost and they never go on to develop dementia. But we do know that there's a very strong association between stroke and dementia risk. And this um, increases with age. And this is you know, likely because when someone has um, finally has a stroke and particularly if it happens in older age, as we age, it's harder for the brain to recover essentially. So, so being able to sort of bounce back, um, that's why with traumatic brain injuries, when they happen in children, we often see a better prognosis than if it happens in an older adult simply because of the brain plasticity and the way the brain is actually able to recover itself. So um, earlier I mentioned how these conditions like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, they're all connected to the vascular system, to you know, our blood vessels. And we have a rich supply of blood vessels in the brain which is demonstrated you know, by the slide, by the picture on the right. That is all the vascular system in the brain. So you can see that it's a very, very rich blood supply. Um, you know, primary inputs are through the carotid arteries. And so this is why whenever there is a vascular condition that may lead to blockage, whether it's you know, in the heart, you know, whatever part it can actually go up to the brain and actually create an occlusion, which would then lead potentially to stroke. Um, so I want to talk about another area because um, high blood pressure and the, the spirit mind study that was looking at reducing high blood pressure, that's really important because when we think about high blood pressure, it affects the vascular system. We know that stress, you know, having stressful events and not just, you know, one event or two that occasionally happens, we've all experienced some type of stress. 
But what we know in the literature is that chronic stress, stress that is ongoing, that is pervasive in somebody's life can actually set up the brain in such a way to increase risk for dementia. And when we think about how it is we feel when we're under stress, our blood pressure goes up, we don't engage in healthy um, behaviors most of the time, and we don't sleep, we don't exercise. Those are kind of all part of how we as humans respond to chronic stress. And there have been studies that show that there are actual, if you look at the brain, there's actual different systems that are involved when a person is under stress versus when they're not stressed. And so the areas that are involved in the stress response, I won't get into the you know, nitty gritty neurobiology, but they're the same areas that we see implicated in dementia. So I wanna make that really clear because people think, oh, stress, you know, I can handle it, not a big deal. But when it's chronic and pervasive throughout one's lifetime, we're learning that it can actually place people at risk for dementia. So I was funded by the Alzheimer's Association. As they mentioned, they support a lot of researchers like myself. So I had received um, some funding to actually, you know, interrogate this question about people who have had a lifetime of stress and adversity, how is that associated with dementia risk or risk for cognitive decline? So this graph, I know it's um, you know not the prettiest, but what this shows is that this is looking at on the, on the bottom scale here, what we call the x-axis, this is looking at how much um, stress and, and adversity the person reported over the course of their lifetime. So we have a very comprehensive interview that we give that looks at all types of stressors somebody has experienced over the course of their lifetime and how stressful was it? How long did it last? We get age of onset. When did the stressor end? So we really ask, ask people to recount these experiences that they've had. And then we actually give them cognitive testing to see you know, how they're performing across a number of different tasks. And what we see is that as somebody's lifetime stress you know, increases, their performance on these global cognitive measures are decreased. And so this is just an association. We don't know about causal relationships. It could very well be that people with lower cognitive performance tend to report higher levels of lifetime stress. So what I'm showing you here though, is that we're seeing the association. So we wanted to take it a step further and that is to actually look at the brain. So we have really good imaging techniques that allows us to look at brain volume. And we wanted to see you know, the relationship between lifetime stress and volume of the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in the stress response and involved in a lot of areas of dementia. And we saw very similar findings. Higher experiences with lifetime stress and adversity was associated with reduced prefrontal cortical volume. And then I asked the question, well, let's follow these people over the course of a few years. And maybe it's not about just how stressed they are or the stressful experiences, but how do they cope with those experiences? So now we're sort of thinking about people's sort of individual resiliency, if you will, and how they manage their stress. And so in this study, what we did was we grouped people into um, those who reported high levels of lifetime stress, but tended to endorse more maladaptive coping styles. We had people with high stress, but adaptive coping styles, lower stress, maladaptive coping, and low stress and adaptive coping. And so the baseline, the yellow line is how they were performing on our tests that measure executive functioning, which is more having to do with the prefrontal cortex that I showed you in the previous slide. And 
for then we looked at them two years later to see whether or not there was a change. And lo and behold, we saw that the group that had reported that they were had high levels of lifetime stress, but they tended to use maladaptive coping skills, they showed the greatest decline in their executive functioning, which is very interesting because that is the area of the brain that really helps us to manage our emotions. So we're seeing that this is an area that's implicated, um, particularly when people don't cope very well. However, for those who also reported high levels of lifetime stress, but they tended to use better coping strategies, we did not see the same type of decline. So, um, I've been talking a lot about, you know, sort of why we need to, you know, think about cognition. We actually have ways to measure it. And a neuropsychological assessment, many people have not even heard of what this is. And so I just want to say that it is a comprehensive evaluation that is often referred by primary care or neurology. And the idea is that we are asked to diagnose most of the time. Um, we are asked to describe the cognitive functions that have been impaired or that still remain intact. And we can use testing to track changes over time. And it really helps to inform rehabilitation efforts because if somebody's having impairment in their memory, it is not a good idea to try to, you know, give them, um, remind, you know, expect them to remember certain things within a treatment plan. You might have to write things down and pin it up. So it can really help with strategizing how that person can compensate for any impairments. So um, neuropsychological evaluation is not invasive. You are sitting face to face with one other person who is administering a bunch of different tests that can take three to five hours, which is a long period of time, I know, but it's because we're gathering lots of data. Unlike screeners, where doctors will give a screener for dementia, that's five minutes. And it doesn't cover things like mild cognitive impairment. Um, it, it, most of the time, screeners are going to capture people when they're further along the impairment trajectory. But if we wanna catch people earlier, we have to test multiple domains using multiple tests. This is just an example of a test that we might give. This is a clock drawing test. And so you can see that this is a test where we ask people to draw the clock and then we say, okay, I want you to make the hand say that it's 1110. And the person with early Alzheimer's disease, which is the top picture, they can draw the circle, the numbers are pretty much placed okay, but you can see that it's not really clean. And the numbers are not exactly precise of where they would be placed on a clock. The person with moderate Alzheimer's disease, they still have the numbers um, intact, but they're sort of falling out of the circle. So being able to sort of keep that spatial, that visual spatial component um, in mind is more difficult to do in the moderate stages. And in the severe stages, we cannot even make out the numbers. So that's where, you know, and this is just an example of one of many types of tests that we use. Here's another test. This is a visual test where we ask people to copy this figure. And I know it looks like a really complicated figure, but we look at how people draw this figure. And so just to, to give you an idea, after they draw the figure, they're asked to then draw the figure from memory. So immediately after they've copied it, after a 10 minute delay and after a 30 minute delay, the person at the very top, that's a very normally intact person. Now I know it's not the greatest person. I mean, not the greatest drawing, but at least most of the figure components are there. However, for case B, which is at the bottom, you can see that the copy is really poor. So the way they approached the figure and copying it was not good. And then you can see they lost substantial details of the figure as time went on. Okay, so I'm going to just um, talk really briefly about 
how do you go about getting a neuropsychological evaluation? Because most people don't know this. One, do not be shy to ask your primary care physician to make a referral to neurology if you have any concerns about your cognition. If you are a family member who's dealing with somebody who you might think has cognitive compromise, immediately request that your primary care makes a referral to neurology. You have this right. Then once you are seen by the neurologist, you need to tell them, I want a neuropsychological evaluation. And they need to provide a referral for that because otherwise you can't go to a center like UCLA or a lot of these other centers that do neuropsych evaluations. You can't just show up at the door. You need to have a referral. That's why that piece is really important. And a lot of insurances can be very finicky about these evaluations because they have the word psychological in them, even though this really has to do with cognitive. But the reason we say psychological is because as we all know, when our cognition is um, declining, you might see changes in mood. So we do in these evaluations, evaluate somebody's mood status. And so often insurance carriers, doctors don't know to refer this as um, a medical service. Neuropsych evaluations are covered under medical, not psychological services. And so often doctors may not know this. So then when they put in for a psychological evaluation, that's all they say, it gets denied. And so it's important that they document the medical necessity of having this evaluation and that it's not a mental health service. So I just always tell people that because it's probably one of the biggest barriers of getting an evaluation. Um, under um, Medi-Cal, um, these are called, and, and I think Medicare functions the same, but these are called central nervous system assessments, not a psychological assessment. Um, okay, so all that's all I have to say. I wanted to try to leave some time in case anyone had questions or, but thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Timms, and thank you, uh, Susan, very much. It was an excellent overview of the latest research, as well as the importance of early detection, the importance of lifestyle modifications, and, and how to navigate obtaining a neuropsychological test. So thank you for that um, comprehensive information, both of you. Uh, with the time that we have remaining, uh, we want to hear from you. We'd like your questions. If you can put them in the chat, uh, that would be great so that I can then um, share those with our panelists. 